Our lesson for this Sunday, it is, of course, the Sunday of the Holy Trinity. We celebrate that triune name of God. It comes from the book of John, the 16th chapter. Jesus said these words to his disciples, I still have many things to tell you, but you cannot hear them now. But when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take away what is mine, or take what is mine and declare it to you. And all that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said, and he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. You notice in our lesson, uh, if you're welcome to take out your sermon handouts, by the way, those watching online, that is posted on our website at www.holytrinityeastpgh.com. You're welcome to download and follow along with that handout. But I want to start with a story that's kind of, it's not a true story, it's just a made up story, but it was about a man who had experienced a great flood in his city, and he was trying to get from point A to point B. The problem was, there was a big tree that was submerged in water that was blocking his path. And try as hard as he might, might, he could not move and not budge that big tree. And so he decided to go a little bit further down the river and try another direction. The problem was there was another big tree that was blocking his way and he couldn't move it, couldn't move it anyway, couldn't push it out of the way. It was just too big, too powerful. And then he went over to another tree there was another tree to the right of that. There was absolutely no way he could get from point A to point B because these three trees were blocking his way. He said, well, dagnabbit, when that, that, that river subsided, I'm going to go and cut down those three trees. Well, the river subsided, and to his shock, there wasn't three trees. It was one enormous tree with three huge branches coming out from the center. Well... That's just a simple illustration and story, but tells us a little bit about who God is. We talk about God, the Holy Trinity, and if you just understand one thing, when we talk about the Trinity, people get confused and say, this doesn't make any sense. God is one tree, three branches. Can a tree be one big tree with three branches? Can a person be one person, but three different relationships, depending on who you are, as Pastor Dave, as Coach Jones? As you've heard, as dad, as husband, whatever those things are, we have many different roles, many different venues in which we operate. Same thing as God. God comes to us in many different ways. And in this case, as Christians, we celebrate God in the name of Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And so I want you to take a look at that as we pull out our thing. And, you know, a friend of mine was actually approached by one of his parishioners and said, what the heck is so great about the Holy Trinity? That's such a boring thing. Where's the good news in all this? And he said, because it's the Holy Trinity and it's freaking cool. It is cool that this is the way God reveals himself to us through the gift of the Holy Trinity. And I'm really stoked and excited about this because it is such a cool thing that we call God Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I'm going to hopefully communicate how excited I get about this. And I hope you get excited about it too, because there is some really, really good news in this God. First of all, when we call God Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, these things are only intended to give us a small glimpse into who God is. Because, here, take a look. That's how much we know about God. You see it? Can you see between my fingers? Barely. You could maybe fit a, a sheet of paper there. That's all we humans know about God. God is bigger than the universe. And the names that we call God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, only give us a glimpse into a minuscule part of who God is and what He's come to do for us. Now, I want to speak about geeky. I'm going to get real geeky here. You might like this. You may not. But there is a Swedish mathematician. I apologize. I don't remember his name. But he was one of the big movers and shakers behind the unified theory movement and being able to create one mathematical equation to explain the universe and everything that exists in it. And what he ended up coming to the conclusion, he ended up being able to prove this mathematically, how he does this, I don't know. But what he did is he, he kind of finally came to the conclusion that this is foolishness. He said the problem is when you start trying to break down the mathematical equations to explain the universe, 
The mathematical equations to explain the universe actually cannot be contained in the universe itself because the equation itself would be too enormous. And he said on the basis of that, I know you're, some of you are like, I'm not sure I'm understanding it. He's saying the equation to figure out how the universe was created, everything that exists in the universe is bigger than the universe itself, and therefore he's come to the conclusion there must be a God. Because the universe cannot even contain the mathematical equation necessary to explain the universe. Something must be transcendent and beyond the universe for this universe to be in existence, and that thing is God. There's a Swedish mathematician. I'll try to look up his name and see if I can put that out there. The point is, is that we know this much, and those words, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, just give us a glimpse of who it is. The truth is, God is infinitesimal. And we can't know all that God is, because our knowledge is finite. But the names that we call God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are a beginning of a deep relationship with God. And the triune name, that triune form, expresses our uniquely Christian theology of God's salvation message. So again, those people who think that there's nothing cool about the theology of the Trinity, hold on to your hats if you've got them, because I'm going to show you how the triune name of God communicates everything you need to know about God and everything you need to know about what God wants to do for you. So let us take a look at this. Let's start into the very first name that we call God. God the Father. Father. Okay, there you go. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. What does this mean? First of all, let me tell you what it doesn't mean. It does not mean that God is the old man in the sky with a long white beard sitting on the throne. There is nothing in the Bible that communicates to us that God is a man. I know you're saying, but we call God he. That's a personification of God because it's better than calling God it. Am I not right? Mm -hmm. So we got to call God something, and we personify God because we, we have to be able to communicate God in a way that makes some sense to us. So we personify God by calling God he, but let me tell you, God is not a he. How do I know this? Because in the book of Genesis, it tells us that God placed his image in both male and female. God is not a God of genitalia. God isn't sitting there as an old guy in the sky. What means to be God is more than being flesh and blood. There's something more in there. And so God is neither male nor female, but transcends our understanding of gender. So the reason why we call God He again is because it's better than calling God It. And it's also really awkward using the politically correct language of never calling God He. I mean, try to do that someday. Try to spend all day talking about God and never use the word He. It's almost impossible. It, it, it is awkward. And it seems awkward. There's some churches where they try to do that, where every time they come up with a pronoun He, they replace it with God. And it just sounds really silly. Let's just not worry about it. It's just a pronoun, but God is not a male. But what does it mean for God to be Father for us? And how is that important to you? What's that apply to your life? And again, I already said to you, I believe in God the Father Almighty. What? Maker. Creator or maker of heaven and earth. God is the creator who gives us life. That's what we're trying to tell you when we talk about God the Father. And there's another thing that you hear when we talk about God the Father, that God is blessed us to be the heirs of the kingdom of heaven. Now, I don't know if you realize how cool that is, but I want you to imagine the most beautiful property that you've looked at and you said, oh, I wish I could own that property. Maybe it's that beautiful chalet overlooking the Shenandoah Valley or something like that. You said, I wish I could live there. That would be my slice of heaven. Oh, no, your slice of heaven is in heaven. And your slice of heaven is so much more beautiful than that chalet overlooking the Shenandoah Valley or any beautiful property that you could buy on this side of the kingdom because that's a piece of property that is yours and it's got your name on it. God has placed your name on it and it is waiting for you because you are an inheritor of the kingdom of heaven. How amazingly cool is that? Those who only are rent in rental property... Don't worry, you got a beautiful piece in heaven. Your slice of heaven is in the kingdom of come. 
So, with that said, Father is used therefore to communicate to us that we are heirs of God, inheritors of the kingdom of heaven, but there is a problem I want to throw out. There are those who have a problem with the name Father, because it communicates to them their abusive parent who was very destructive. Now, I understand that. I actually had somebody come up to me and said, can I just not call God Father? <laughs> because she really had a hard time with her earthly father and said, my earthly father beat me, treated me rudely, and every time I say that name Father, even though I know it's not the way God is, the hair is just raised on my head. I said, then don't. It's okay. I think God is okay with that. See, I understand. My earthly father beat me mercilessly. I've been beaten unkind. My stepfather beat me unconscious. I've been thrown through a plate glass window. This is true. I got thrown through a plate glass window. When it broke and I went through it uh, and was bleeding and cut up, my stepfather came up to me and said, how dare you break that window? And I got beat again for breaking the window, for being so inconsiderate to being thrown through a plate glass window. I understand what it's like to be beaten by an earthly father to the point where you're bloody and on the ground and actually unconscious. I understand people who've been abused physically, sexually, emotionally by their fathers and have such a difficult time with the language. So we as Christians, you know what we need to do? Instead of just being flippant about it and saying, deal with it. What we need to do because what have I told you the last few weeks is the most important thing? Oh, please help me. Love. We have to be loving. And so if there is somebody who struggles with this language, we need to be loving and understanding. And also to remind them too that earthly fathers do not define for us the Heavenly Father. Even if you had a wonderful father, I know you had a wonderful father, I know many of you had wonderful fathers sitting here today. Even if you had a wonderful earthly father, they cannot compare to the great love and the standard by which our God is to be known. Our Heavenly Father is so much better and so much more impressive than the best earthly father we can imagine. But we do need to be sensitive. So we know as God is Father, the one who creates, the one who is, uh, gives us an inheritance of the kingdom, but that's not all. Oh, I'm not done. God is also the Son. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. Why is that important? Once again, I know another male image, isn't it? Another male image. But you know, Jesus had to be born of something. God wanted to come and live amongst us and had to be enfleshed in a body in some way. And so at that time, 2,000 years ago, because it was the appropriate time to bring God's word of salvation, it was better than being born a female because Jesus, Jesus was crucified already. Three years when he started his ministry. Imagine if he had been a woman. I don't think he would have made it a day without being stoned to death. And so he had to come as something, and being a male at that time was the appropriate choice. But I want you to notice that Jesus kind of corrects us a little bit by making sure he surrounds himself with women as disciples. Now, sometimes that detail is lost when we read the scripture. We only think of the 12 disciples. But I'm telling you, there are more disciples than just the 12. Jesus surrounded himself with hundreds of disciples, and it's very clear and communicated to us in the Bible that many of his key disciples were women. In fact, the ones who showed up to the cross, women. Mary, Mary, Mary. The three Mary. Marys. And Mary. The Mary. No, just three Marys at the cross. Sorry. That they've, re that they've That's right. reported. That's right. That's right. A baker's, a baker's uh, well, whatever. Anyway, so, so the Marys, they showed up there. And, oh, by the way, did you notice that the very first person entrusted with the gospel message was a woman? And what was her name again? Oh, Mary Magdalene. How amazing is that? Mary, remember what we called Mary before? Remember Magdalene means the fortress. Mary the fortress. She was a stunning, powerful woman. And the Bible wants to make sure we understand that. But what does it mean that Jesus is... What does it mean that we call God by Jesus the Son? 
And I think there are several things we learn. Obviously, salvation. I didn't put that. Obviously, there's, there's, it, he has come to announce God's salvation and God's good news of love and forgiveness to us. But in addition to that, there are some things that Jesus can do for us when we talk about God as the Son that we don't think of when we think of God as the Father. God comes to us as the Son, the big brother. Now, I don't know how many of you have had big brothers. I've had two big brothers. And my two big brothers, yes, they, I annoyed them. We talked about that the other week on Mother's Day, and, um, and I annoyed them continually, but I tell you what, I remember when I went to high school for the very first time, it's really scary. I'm a freshman, and my brothers are juniors and seniors, and I'm scared spitless, and you know there are always some bullies in school and this and that. Guess who was there to protect me? Your brothers. My brothers, who I annoyed the heck out of, were there for me when I went to high school. Because they could beat on you, but nobody they, else. That's right. They could beat on me, but nobody else was going to touch their little brother. And that's what a big brother does for you. Okay? That's what Jesus does for you. He says, nobody's going to touch you. I'm going to beat up on you. No, he doesn't say that part. But at any rate, we can often have a more intimate relationship with our siblings than we can even with our parents. And so here's what a big brother does for us. Our big brother Jesus protects us from bullies, stands up for us when no one else will or can, gives us timely and sage advice. <laughs> Sometimes it's wrong in the case of my brothers. They lead the way for us. Oh, I love this one. Jesus does this, but my brothers do this for me. My brothers had to, you know, it, 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 my brothers led the way. And I will tell you, there are a lot of things I got to do at a much younger age because my brothers got to do them first. And once my parents saw how they worked out and said, oh, I guess it's not so bad, they allowed me to do certain things that my brothers couldn't do at a younger age. So they led the way. Jesus leads the way too. He leads the way to the kingdom of heaven for us. He makes a way. And oh, look at this last one. He opens up doors and opportunities for us to enjoy. So we know God as Father. We know God as Son. But wait a minute, one more way, one more name. We know God as the Holy Spirit. Now, I know some of you guys are older like me. Do you remember growing up in a church where you would confess the creed and you'd say, God the Holy Ghost? And that used to terrify me. Because I used to think of, you know, I didn't think of a ghost as being like Casper, the friendly ghost. My ghost was pretty terrifying. And when my mom would say, well, you know, the Holy Spirit was with me when she turned the light on at night, I'd say, that is really not that comforting. Okay? <laughs> that does not help in any way. No, uh, a better translation of that is God the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit, the reason why the, the Bible communicates as Spirit is because not God, is, God is not spooky, but God cannot be contained and God is mysterious. So what we do as Christians, we try to put God in a little box. We try to put a spirit in a box. It escapes. There's no box that can contain the Holy Spirit because the Spirit moves where the Spirit wills in the way in which the Spirit wishes to move, and there's nothing we can do about it. So that's what it's made, meant to communicate to us, that the Spirit moves whatever direction the Spirit so chooses. And the Spirit moves in mysterious and wonderful, spectacular ways in your life. So here is the other thing we learned about the Holy Spirit, letter B under number three. The Spirit is also for everyone. Remember how we talked about in the Old Testament? The Holy Spirit was only gifted to a handful of people. Moses, Elijah, Elisha, artisans who created the tabernacle. And they only received the gift of the Holy Spirit for the time being that they needed the Holy Spirit. And then the Spirit was taken from them. However, our big brother, Jesus opened up the Holy Spirit to be gifted to everybody. And so today, when you talk about the Holy or the God being inside of your heart, you are talking about who? The Holy Spirit. And you do have the Holy Spirit inside of your heart because of Big Brother opening that opportunity and that door for you. The Spirit, therefore, is for everyone. And so, oh, here's the other thing. Notice my hole under your hat, sir. Hold on your hat. Anybody got? Oh, I had a woman with a hat on today. She actually was holding on to her hat. Yeah. So hold on to your hats on this one. Remember how we talked about all this male language for God, the Father, God, the Son. The word spirit, are you ready, is feminine. 
Because God wants to include women in the image of God as well. Because God is not me, a male or a female, but God has certainly some feminine characteristics in the spirit just moves where it wills and blesses whomever the spirit chooses to bless and promises to nurture you, care for you, and be present with you. So what this means for you is that God not only moves in mysterious ways, but God wants to be involved in your daily life and inspire you to become the type of person that God has created you to become. So whenever you speak of God being near you, you're talking about the gift of the Spirit being inside of you. You are never, ever, 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 ever alone. You might be abandoned by your family, by every single friend, but God never leaves you alone. I'm going to tell a story. No. Yes. Why? True story. This time. Why? Because stories are memorable. That's why. So here's a story, a true story about a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was one of my great faith heroes. If you don't know who he is, please look him up. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran pastor in Nazi Germany. And if you remember, if you've ever watched the movie Valkyrie with Tom Cruise in it, he isn't in the movie, but he was in that plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler. He was the one, yes, he was the one. He wasn't sure whether he should be involved in that type of plot, but finally he said, you know, sometimes committing an evil is better than living with a greater evil, which was Adolf Hitler. And so he was passing messages and, and facilitating a lot of the messages that were passed back and forth. And so when all these arrests were made of all these people that participated in the plot, he was thrown in jail. And he had been responsible for the escape of thousands of Jews out of Germany and just... Uh, you know, creating like a, a, a train of a human train to get these Jews out of uh, Germany and so forth. But here he was now in jail. I think he was like 38, 39 years of age. He spent quite a while in jail. It was very cold, damp, harsh conditions. And he remembers that he wrote in his journal uh, about spending Christmas Eve one day and thinking of his family and missing his family and, and the Christmas trees and, and the presents and, uh, and just the baked goods and everything and missing all of that. And here he was in this cold, dark, dank cell on the Christmas all by himself. And then he said, then I finally understood what Christmas is about. That Jesus, the brother, has gifted me with the Holy Spirit so that I might celebrate this Christmas not by myself, but in the presence of God. And he said it was the most beautiful Christmas He'd ever celebrated because he knew the Spirit of God was with him. I think it's an amazing story, and it's a true story, unlike my first one. But it is also a reminder that there is nowhere that you go where the Spirit of God doesn't follow. So I hope you got excited about this. That triune name of God communicates to us the, just the beginning, the, the tip of the iceberg of our relationship with God. And once we look beneath the surface, we understand that God is so much bigger. When you start developing that relationship with God, it cannot communicate everything you need to know about God, but it does get you in a deeper relationship with God so that you can start understanding that this, what we know about God, is so much bigger. And what this God wants to do for you is to love you and bring you his salvation. Did it geek you out enough? Is that exciting to you? God has blessed you through the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are amazingly grateful for the blessings of this life, for the love of the Father, Son, and Spirit, the Creator who made us in His image, who gifted us with life, who promises us an inheritance the kingdom to come, for the Son who made a way for us to enter into that kingdom because of his love for us, for the gift of the Holy Spirit that sustains us until that day when we become those inheritors of that kingdom of God. We give you thanks for following through these difficult challenges of life, and we thank you for celebrating with us. We thank you for protecting us from those bullies of faith and life. And this life, we thank you for standing beside us in our times of need. For it is in your precious name we give thanks and pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.